today I'm speaking with Mr. Dale Bretnell, and it's November 22nd. Mr. Bretnell, do I, do I have your permission to record your voice? Yes, you do. Okay. It's a little gravelly today. <clears throat> well, it's fall, and sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. Voices get that way. I'm talking you, with you today because of your long-time experience in Ames education. But first, we need to know where you actually started out. Please tell me where you were born and your birth date. Uh, I was born in Adams County, Iowa on September 7th, 1919. And um, I guess it was on a farm. You had farm experience as a child. What led you to education? Well, growing on the farm, there were uh, more opportunities to work on the farm than do anything else. But we did have church connections, and it seemed to me that, the, and the families all seemed together at the church, and I noticed it at growing up that um, some of the teachers and my cousins who were teachers and some of my friends who were older, I sort of admired because they were coming in from college and uh, they had uh, automobiles and that appealed to me and uh, that seemed to be like, well, that might be something to consider rather than uh, farming. Did your parents have something to say about that? Did they want you to stay on the farm or were they okay with you pursuing education? No, it was okay with the, with the family that I pursue this. Uh, in fact, they wanted both, both my brother and I uh, to continue education beyond high school. But of course there were times when uh, uh, we were required on the farm for harvesting, uh, both planting and then harvesting the crops. Uh, keep in mind that this was at a time when uh, uh, things were brewing in the Far East and also uh, things were being stirred up in Europe. So it was kind of a time there where we didn't know what we were doing, but there was one thing that was very evident at that time. Food was a necess necessity. So uh, were you in World War II? Did, were you a soldier in World War II? You said things were brewing in uh, No, Europe. this is, uh, <clears throat> this happened that as you get into high school, which I graduated in 1937, uh, that, you know, you didn't know what you were going to do. And that was not only true with me, but that was true with the population of, of young people at that time. And uh, it was quite prominent, though, if whatever happened, that uh, the crops were going to be taken in, and they were not going to remove you from the farm unless someone else could take help, mm -hmm. and that wasn't evident at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, what I did, and my brother did, was to the first year out of uh, high school, I entered uh, University of Northern Iowa, which was uh, Iowa State Teacher College at that time, and got a year of college. And then um, that year of college then put me in a position to, uh, and a rural, rural uh, I guess, uh, notification, rural entities were quite prominent at that time in agriculture. So I thought, well, so is education. And so I thought, well, I'll take the, the rural school curriculum, which was kind of tough, but, <laughs> you know, because setting that up, you had to have your uh, music, and you had, had your art classes, you had to have certain courses for uh, graduation, and also continuing on if I wanted to, uh, not knowing how far or what would happen. <clears throat> so that's what I did. And uh, at the end of that first year, I had a job in a rural school. Now that was uh, close to home. Saturdays I could work at home. My brother was still at home, and, uh, and they needed teachers. And some of my friends were teachers, as well as several of my cousins. And uh, 
So I took this job, and it was good. It was on Highway 34, west of Corning, and uh, my board and room for a month was $12. And, uh, and that was a country food. That was home cooking. And I stayed in that position for two years, and then I went into a consolidated area at that time, which was closer to home, called Nevinville. And that's when the war and everything was picking up just a little bit at a tempo that uh, was quite uncertain. But the, the gaps between the farming, I was able to pick up summer school, which I did because that was during the summer and uh, my brother was at home and he could take care of that. But and all the time I was picking up more, te more education as well as more teaching experience which all helped mm -hmm. later on. Now, I do know that at one time you came to Iowa State and you went into the engineering um, curriculum. Yes. And how did that happen? Well, that was kind of a, a unique situation because uh, I had been in, um, I'd, been I had been teaching and this opportunity came up <coughs> Because I'd had a schooling at U and I, Iowa State Teachers College, and basic curriculum and teaching, and also a little interest in industrial arts, which gave me interest in machine shop and all that type of thing, which was the one that, uh, and blueprints and reading and design and that kind of thing. So when this opportunity uh, opened up here at uh, Iowa State, I asked, you know, I enrolled and was accepted. So it was, a, it was really a crash course in advanced engineering and design, and um, and not knowing what was happening to me or to us at that time, um, Lockheed aircraft had uh, put their fingers on a number of students upon the completion of this course. I didn't know that. And uh, upon completion, that was 12 weeks, and it was something like, oh, 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. And it was quite rigorous. And I worked out at the quarry sometimes at the, in, in the night, and, which is now um, a big enterprise in Story <laughs> County. And so you were going to school you had a big school day, and then you worked at the quarry at night. Worked My gosh! For, for a couple, a couple hours at night, uh huh. Yeah, <clears throat> and sometimes four. Mm -hmm. It depends how the how the curriculum schedule fit in, and mm -hmm. and it was good. It was Iowa State. It was welding. It was a machine shop, and and mm -hmm. it fit right into the drafting that I'd had at, at Iowa State teachers. And then at the end of that period. Then that's what happened. The, they came in and the, the draft boards, and they had contact with Lockheed. That I didn't know anything about, it. and they said, "You're going. You can go to Lockheed Aircraft in Burbank, California. That's where we want you." Here is a farm boy, yeah. and you're ending up in yeah. California to work on what? Uh, at Lockheed on the B-17s and the Navy torpedo bombers. I'm kind of getting goosebumps thinking about that. Were, were you aware you were working on these big? I know it was a, it was a big, big jump, but it worked. It worked out real well because, um, well, of course, then you, you had. Uh, well, then I had to resign my teaching job. And that was okay, and now all this was behind the scenes with the draft board. I didn't know anything about it, about this. I didn't know anything about it until after the war, because my cousin's sister was on the draft board, but I didn't know it in Adams County. So um, I had a low draft number, 278, so mm -hmm. I figured I'd go. but. <clears throat> Going into Lockheed then, I 
went into the final assembly on the torpedo bomber uh, PV-2s and also the first B-17G, the last one they made. It was quite interesting and that was, and I'd been on armament, the final assembly, mm -hmm. assembling the whatever the aircraft was supposed to do when I got there. It was the armament. You helped, the you helped build it. Did you ever get to ride in it? Oh yes, we used to test ride. Oh yeah, we installed all the turrets and the guns mm -hmm. in the B-17 and uh, the B-17G, and then we. Uh, this was right to final assembly. Those went in after the plane was just about finished mm -hmm. to go out the door to test flight. Now, um, when you were teaching school many years later. Did you ever tell any of those children the stories about how you worked on those big planes? No. no. <laughs> if they knew, they would have been no. very alert. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know. You, you just went on and didn't uh -huh. say too much about it. But it was, it was real interesting. And of course, it was there when uh, Pearl Harbor hit, mm -hmm. and uh, that was something else. And, and I won't get into the. Sure. The that, that politics product, of it, but yeah. It was highly secret, and uh, and then I worked in the research of the flight testing, of the. Uh, in fact, the research we had German Messerschmitts there, and we had uh, we had uh, ja the Japanese Zero aircraft, mm -hmm. and it was highly researched that you could go over and and see because we mm. were working the the planes would leave, go through the test flight. At Lockheed, and then they head to Europe. And we put in the first B-17 Chin turret, the Chin turret that mm -hmm. was in. So we had. We wow! Had, what an experience. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so uh, the war ends, and you um, leave Lockheed. Tell me how you got back into teaching. Well, when I then I came back to the farm. And uh, Dad was increasing uh, the farming operations, and he had bought another farm. My brother was in the war too. When he was in the Battle of the Bulge, and then that fracas over there. And uh, he, it's uh, oh, then we were able to have tractors. He was able to get tractors so he could do more on his mm -hmm. own. And he knew that my brother wanted to be on farming, and while I was there, they wanted teachers. So, what did I do? And they just wanted me to come and teach. You know, homeschool, uh, all kinds of offers were coming in, and I thought, well, what's going on here? It's probably better paying than working on a farm. <laughs> so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I went back to UNI. So how did you get to Ames? How did you get a teaching job in Ames? Well, I'd after the war I'd been been back in school, and had an opportunity to um, go back to the school that I had left. But also I had the opportunity to come to uh, Dallas Center, Iowa. There were a lot of teaching positions open at that time, and that was junior high, and went into junior high teaching. Uh, and departmentalized there because another young fellow at that particular time was a fellow named Bill Ellen. And uh, I was the eighth grade teacher and, and later principal, and Bill was seventh grade teacher. And uh, so we decided, now this is when you could decide how to work your school uh, operations, both as class sizes and your schedules. And those schedules, Bill, Bill decided that he would take the social studies of seventh and eighth grade. Another lady would take the language arts, and I'd take the math and science. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that worked out for um, five years there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I hadn't quite got finished my degree yet, and it was kind of interesting because we were. I had I was supervising the students from Iowa State University, <laughs> but I couldn't graduate from U and I because they wouldn't let me. I hadn't had my senior high student teaching. 
this makes me laugh. You had been teaching for many years, but they wouldn't wouldn't accept it. You had to have that class on student teaching. That's right. Yes. Because I'd been in industrial arts and and um, and science, and they wouldn't they wouldn't let me graduate until I had student teaching. So I had to resign from Dallas Center in the spring, three months, and go to back to U and I. And I had student teaching in senior senior high up there in architectural drafting. And at that time, we were we were graduating or could be graduating, and I had uh, and of course then I could teach. Uh, well now where are we going now? <laughs> well in the meantime, Bill Illett had resigned from Dallas Center and gone to Osceola, and he came back into Ames. And I'd, I'd heard a lot of good things about Ames school system and in central Iowa, and then I'd had some experience with the pub, with the university in school. I've been back there since several times. But it was, uh, I had a call in the placement office. Dr. Thompson at the University of Northern Iowa said, get going. I went in, in the placement office, and there was a call there from Ames to get my credentials and get to Ames as soon as possible. And about what year was this? That was in 1953. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I walked in the placement office there, and there's another superintendent there, and he said, look, I'm just looking. He said, we have a job for you. And that was not Ames. And I said, well, I have some other offers too. But I said, I'm going to, I'm going to check this out. So I, um, I called back to Ames to Carl Brown. Mm -hmm. And Carl Brown said, uh, you have an interview uh, this weekend, whenever you can get in here. And we would like to interview. And I said, well, fine. So Dr. Thompson at UNI said to me, he said, are you going, he said, you're going to Ames for an interview? And he announced it to the entire class. And I said, yes, but that doesn't mean I have a job. Well, he said, if you can get to Ames, if you have an opportunity to get to Ames, it's really a good opportunity for you. So we had an interview in Ames in the Roundfield House, which used to be the field lab. Well, it was the old field house. Mm -hmm. Had an interview there with uh, Carl Brown, then the elementary director, and a couple of the elementary principals. And, and then that's when we met with uh, and some of the people you might recall, Alice Rose Brooks, she was on the school board, Dr. Taylor. Taylor and uh, Dr. Cole from uh, McFarland Clinic, and uh, and then Frank Adams, and Frank Adams and I visited on the back steps of the <laughs> of the funeral parlor down there. And uh, the thing that I liked about Ames was kind of unique because. Uh, we had I've been in the rural school area, and then in Dallas Center they consolidated, brought a lot of rural schools in, so I was familiar with that. And then as you get into Ames, we knew that uh, population was growing, and so many school districts were going to be mixed up. So you'd have parents or a group of children from one di one permanent district, which is now mm -hmm. a, a, a little upheaval mm -hmm. to come transfer to another district for a year or two, uh, particular grade level. So uh, I accepted the job about two weeks before school started, and that was interesting. And it was Whittier, and I had a fourth and fifth grade class at Whittier and principal. So really it was... Um, I want to stop you just a second. You were the principal? And fourth grade and fifth grade? The, fifth, the fourth grade and fifth grade were combined. They were combined, okay. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that worked out pretty well. And then they, um, they have a lot of things. Uh, Ames was expanding at that mm -hmm. time. It was a very interesting time. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, um, uh, Harry McPhail uh, was the superintendent. And he was, uh, was I Harry? Yeah, Harry. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he, uh, he was a, an individual that that uh, had a great diversity in the classroom for children and teachers to handle that. So you were getting into more individualization at that time, mm -hmm. and that was maintained too. So I'm going to go back just a second. Uh, what characteristic or what part of your experience do you think got you the job in Ames? Why do you, why do you think they liked you? Uh, Mike, I, well, I tell you, men were coming into the picture then. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Ellett and I and Dallas Center were, were two of the male teachers in the state of Iowa at the, at the junior high level. Mm -hmm. And I was really looking at junior high. And then when I, there was um, Elmer Arn and Herb Hatch, and they were expanding. And the other thing is that they were, uh, Dr. Um, Palmer, as Iowa State teachers, he was my main, he was my advisor. And he was quite an educator as well as an industrial arts professor, but he believed, and also the county superintendent in Adams County, who was, I was under direction, believed in uh, teaching the whole child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that, because you can, uh, you can use different parts of the, uh, you never know what part of the child is really going to emerge mm -hmm. that they uh, feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm and may use it a leverage to strengthen their other mm -hmm. academics. So let's um, go back to 1953, and you're walking into the fourth and fifth grade class at Whittier for the first time. Can you remember that first day in Ames? What was it like? What did you do? Well, it, it was a quite a I thought about it quite a bit, but it didn't. It didn't bother me, but it, because I'd had fourth and fifth grade before, and and in the rural school you had K eight, and thirty two children, and that was our organization itself. And then when you brought, then in Dallas Center there we had the the, the combining part yeah. departmentalization. That didn't bother me, but then so here you have these fourth and fifth graders. And uh, they were pretty structured. They'd been a pretty structured school system, you know, kind of lockstep. And, mm -hmm. and uh, but the other thing I liked about Ames, as I found out, and I'll come back to your question, was that uh, they did not necessarily ask me to do the same thing there, or want me to do the same thing that we were doing at they were doing at Meeker. In other words, you could work with the teachers and and the community and the parents, and that has been a very valuable experience. And it's hard to let loose if, uh, because uh, I just don't believe uh, everybody being on the same page on the fifth day of March in mathematics. That, that just doesn't work. Kids don't work that way, and teachers don't work that way, and and you know where you're going, you want, you want the end achievement. Now those children there in uh, fourth and fifth grade, remember we didn't have a sixth grade, they were going to Roosevelt. And uh, so it's a matter of uh, academics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the first thing I did, and Harry McPhail, they were updating the schools with materials, supplemental materials, enhancing the facilities, and uh, that building was a good building, easy to walk in. It had oak floors on it that were on, that were on, that had spring in them. 
and you could walk on that all day and be comfortable. You did not a cement floor. But uh, the, the program, uh, you follow, you did your, they did, they had a good academic program. And then we, from there on, it expanded into all kinds of opportunities. The whole system expanded, mm -hmm. I think, from then. One thing I didn't like, it had two light bulbs in the, hanging down from the ceiling, calcimine walls. And uh, superintendent said, modernize this building. Get some color in it. Mm -hmm. I threw out 50 or 50, 47 orange crates for library books in there. And uh, of course, that made no difference to library book where it is, but that was the vintage of where we were in. But it was good. It was, they had a tremendous parent-teacher organization at, uh, at Whittier. Whittier. Yes, they did. And very proud of that and the fact that uh, most of them were homegrown children. They grew up there. We did bring children in from the Crawford area at one time for a couple of years. And that was, that was fine. That was because our class sizes were dropping and we could mm -hmm. handle them there, especially at the kindergarten. And um, you were your own, you were your own teacher. I mean, mm -hmm. you, and... Uh, well, let's go back to that um, day in 1953. Did you start your class with the Pledge of Allegiance? Did you have something that you did every day? Or how did you get your class started? And, and did they have books that you liked and that sort of thing? Well, cl classes then were from... Uh, Nine o'clock in the morning until four. And you had the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, you did. And um, we had our own music only once a week. And you had art about once a month. And physical education, we were trying to bring phys ed into the, into the curriculum. And it was coming, and everybody mm -hmm. wanted it, but we just had to wait for it to develop and the opportunities to take place. But mm -hmm. it did happen. <laughs> it took about five or six years. Mm -hmm. And there's such a, such a gap there in child development if you only teach the academics. Mm -hmm. Because the music and the art and the physical education of recreation was all part of that individual. Well, that is just what you said, because sometimes you need to find a way into the child to figure out what motivates the child, and it might be one of those things that are not the three R's that yes. might yeah. get them going. Yeah, well, they may be very strong in the three R's, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we'll need another outlet, and that will enhance mm -hmm. the three R's, and they right. themselves are elevated. How big was the class? How many children when you first came to Ames? I think there were 18 to 22 children. That sounds like a nice size. Mm -hmm. very, yes, they were. Very doable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you have lots of good teaching materials in the early 1950s, or did you have to... No. No. <laughs> you didn't. No. You had what they provided for you, and that was your math. Mm -hmm. And the thing that uh, both Irene and I did when we, when she was teaching too, not here in Ames, not here in Ames, but in Dallas Center and, mm -hmm. and in Wyota, we didn't have teaching materials. So, uh, but we did have opportunities to, to get materials, but you did it on an individual basis. So I'd like to tell you, out in the garage, uh, you would bring in material, like you could write to McCormick during, and they would send you materials. Mm -hmm. The chocolate uh, Hershey, Hershey, and John Deere, and General Motors, and Ford, and uh, and travel agencies. So you use that as your media, mm -hmm. and uh, to get their imagination going and to well, yes, show to them know things. where they yeah. were. Otherwise, it's just talking and repeating mm -hmm. back. Hopefully, they can remember to get the right answer. You know when it comes up, but. And science had to be enhanced in Ames. Uh, Ames had a good uh, reading program, though, that, because they, as I recall, when the youngster got into seventh grade, they better be prepared for literature. 
Mm -hmm. And very little remedial reading or basic reading. There was some mm -hmm. basic reading there, mm -hmm. but it more or less moved into the literature area from seventh grade on up. Mm -hmm. And now they're teaching remedial reading in high school. Which, <laughs> you know, there would be an extreme failure over that time if you... Mm -hmm. If you weren't reading that by right. that level. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the kids in the early 1950s. What were their attitudes like? What? How did they behave in school? Uh, what, what, what were the children like? In the 1950s, uh, uh, I don't know, it seemed like, well, the rural area, they knew why they came to school. And many of the children, they walked. They walked uh, a mile, mm -hmm. sometimes a quarter mile, sometimes just across the, the street. But the children knew why they were coming to school. So discipline was really never a problem. Mm -hmm. was, and, that, and would you say that was the same attitude in Ames yes, as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was the same attitude here. And then mm -hmm. when you, uh, I don't know, it seemed like there's some other external, a lot of external uh, uh, factors that children have to deal with now mentally and time-wise and peer relationships that uh, I don't think they had to deal with at that particular time. Mm -hmm. It was, could I say it was simpler or less complex? Is that? I would say it was uh, simpler then, mm -hmm. but we knew that they were going to be, they could handle a complex situation, but you don't want deviant complexity. <laughs> so you see, you've got complexity and basic issues, then you've got <laughs> other social problems that are getting involved. I know that every child that a teacher comes in contact with is a special person. I understand that. But I also know that sometimes there are children that distinguish them themselves in really good ways. Can you remember, I know this might put you on the spot a little bit, but could you remember children that you particularly liked or you enjoyed and you know where they went in life? Well, of course, that's, uh, that's what you like to see, and that's a challenge in teaching. Uh, if those characteristics are in a child, they better be, uh, they should be discovered. That's also a, uh, a leverage for other academic. Yes, uh, every, every youngster has some unique feature, uh, interest. And sometimes it's hard to find. And uh, you don't want to have them afraid of school or afraid of the teacher or afraid to ask questions, and you don't want to deprive them of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. You may have to put it off because some of them are just full of it, you know. But I like that. This is what I liked about Ames. Well, in fact, down the center, too, was that you were allowed to do that, and but you needed to have a reason for doing it, and you needed to share it with the parent mm -hmm. and the superintendent. Mm -hmm. And you never know for sure how things are going to turn out. Mm -hmm. And I've been surprised myself. And I could, I could, you asked kind of a dark question there. <laughs> yes, uh, there are children uh, that you work with and you were overwhelmed with what they developed and what they, you know, one, one, I won't, one of them was a doctor who was my mother-in-law's doctor and, um, and then an attorney, you know, and then um, uh, you have uh, another youngster that just didn't develop uh, read. We knew, there's one thing that we did, and this is, this is kind of critical, mm -hmm. is that you can't tell a person how much they really are capable of doing. So Ames, under the leadership of Jim Key and the school board, we did measure and know that there was an aptitude there of that particular individual. Mm -hmm. And that aptitude should be at their advantage and it should be a great insight for the teacher mm -hmm. and the principal. Mm -hmm to monitor to see what was going on and whether it was being developed. 
um, the, the thing is that, of course, once, and that, yeah, that, we just knew it, but we didn't do too much. Some parents, you didn't, w would not necessarily hold that confidentially. Mm -hmm. And when you don't, when that is not held confidentially, then it can be all kinds of... Competition and... Yeah. yeah, my kid does this yeah. better than this right. kid. Yeah, or my yeah. kid is going here. And, uh, mm -hmm. Somebody told me my youngster can do this. And it's it's uh, and so it's easier has to be. And I and I guess so. I felt comfortable about it because uh, what we did was that we did know that aptitude, and and the teacher knew that aptitude, and my role as a teacher and also a principal was to track that, mm -hmm. to see if that was being developed mm -hmm. or, or wasn't being developed. Mm -hmm. Right. Or the teacher was comfortable or not comfortable in developing it, which they should be. Mm -hmm. When did Iowa Test of Basic Skills come into the Ames school system? Was it in the 1950s? Do you remember? Yes. Okay. I, I don't know. recall just the exact day. day. Of course, we had some difficulties, trouble with that because they were, and those can be so specific. Mm -hmm. One youngster just had a terrible time in reading. All it mm -hmm. turns out to be, you know, on a uh, roll mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a youngster that is not is interested in music, but never knew they were uh, musically inclined until the music teacher gets a hold of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, one youngster just could not, that I'm recalling, could not read. We knew they had the ability, but my, and they tried. Every teacher tried until the fourth grade. And one night, about 4:30, I heard a hoop and a holler, and it was a teacher. She said, "So and so broke the same wide open." That's what we've been working for four years. We were so happy about it. We called the parent and told them. Now that now that youngster is uh, head of the Environmental Protection Agency in one of the states. Oh my goodness! Yeah, you see, so <laughs> my goodness. And I and I think that the more you get into this and can mm -hmm. see what's going on, what can happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's interesting and it's fun. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Now, speaking of fun, sometimes, like Art Linkletter said. Kids do the darndest things. So you were a classroom teacher for a long time. Can you share some of those things? Kids doing silly things or funny things or things that you probably were not supposed to smile because you might, <laughs> but maybe inside you were smiling. Well, one of, the, one of the things at Christmas time, you know, the Christmas, we had Christmas at that time, and of course we honored all the religions and that was fine. Now you don't do any of it, but and that's that's the way things are. But uh, yes, some of the some of the children that would, wouldn't read for the teacher would come and read for me and as a principal. Now I'm jumping ahead of things. It's okay. That's a that's a fellow, and mm -hmm. and Crawford, and some of the youngsters that. Um, one youngster just wouldn't read in the second grade to satisfy anybody. He was a good kid, but he just wouldn't read. He was interested mechanically. So when they were building a certain certain uh, part of the city here, residential area, the superintendent of the construction walked in the building one morning and he said, who's been messing with this D8 Caterpillar? <laughs> Here we had a youngster, or maybe two of them, out there and had that thing started and running over the weekend and had driven it around a little bit and parked it back in the same place. You know, uh, what the youngster, age? The youngster wasn't interested in reading, but he could sure get that darn V8 cat running. <laughs> uh, so every youngster he hears that, he probably knows where it is. But that's, <laughs> Uh, That's good. And so then we had to, 
talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. How old was the child? Sixth grade? Figured it out? Second. Second grade? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Going into third. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Goodness. But on the way home from school, he'd watched him do that. And in the mornings, he'd stop and see. So the child had keen observation. Oh, yes. So you knew the child was smart. That's, a, that's another thing. You never know what a child is uh, seeing mm -hmm. or hearing. Mm -hmm. And they don't know it either until it's challenged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at one time, and the other thing I liked about Ames was that we were allowed to do things. In other words, uh, and of course working with the university, I recall one time that you think, well, you and I all see the same thing. We don't. You have different interpretations of what you see. So we had uh, the children, a fourth grade class out at the university, just checking what they could see the difference in evergreen needles. And some of them were just, it's a leaf. And they get down to look at it, and there's really observ critical observation. They could tell what was happening. So, I don't know. It's hard to summarize everything that's sure. going on in this system in 30 <laughs> years, but it's been wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, you were at Whittier. I'm going to take you on your career path. So, your next school was Louise Crawford? Is that your next school? Your next principal? Well, see, I was... They... Um, at Whittier, your as a enrollment grew, then we added an addition on to Whittier. Uh, fifth and sixth grade and a new kindergarten and an activity room. Mm -hmm. And that passed and then, uh, so then I went to half time teaching at Whittier. Bill Ella had half time teaching at Crawford. And finally he then went full time at Sawyer and then I went full time Whittier and full time at Crawford. You had two buildings. I had two buildings. And about what time period was this? That was in. Um, I decided to put you on the spot. About 19. Um, let's see. That was up to 67. Okay. I was five years, so it'd be about 62. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just for our listeners, Whittier Building does not exist anymore. But what was the address of it? Yeah. It was on, it was on uh, just off Lincoln Way, south on Clark Avenue. Okay, yeah, so people know where nope. that... Hazel. Hazel, Hazel yeah, yeah, right, right, because there's a stoplight yeah. in 2010. It's on, it's on Hazel, yeah, yeah, right next to the highway. Uh -huh. Very interesting location because uh, the day Eisenhower, President Eisenhower was in Ames and he motor, motorcade came up Lincoln Way. Well, there, so we decided we were going, I was going to let school out, let the kids out, mm -hmm. and see the president. Of course, there were some people who looked at that and was a little conservative that the principal would do that. They were, you know, well, here it was, the president of the United States. I didn't say anything wrong with it at all. <laughs> I thought it was probably an honor, you know, to get out there. But at Whittier School, they, they, let me tell you some things that happened there. We had uh, the parent-teacher conference, and we dismissed school. Now, I, I didn't make any difference what Meeker was doing or, or Sawyer. We dismissed school. That was what we wanted to do. We dismissed school at 2.30 and had parent-teacher conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think another school was having them, but they had them after school. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't go over to, well, why you did this school? And, well, that was the flexibility in the, mm -hmm. in the system. Well, it mm -hmm. turned out that that was not a bad idea. <laughs> Funny, they decided to do that as a practice in all the schools later. They do, they all do it now, but they didn't then. Mm -hmm. And what was your reason for doing that at that time? Why did you want to dismiss school so that you could do that? Well, it was partly because uh, uh, the parents were there, they, were, they weren't working like they mm -hmm. are now. It gave flexibility to the schedule. And it was part of the academic area. Teachers 
teacher would give up part of their time after school, mm -hmm. and then we'd have to keep part of the school day. It was kind of a cooperative arrangement. Mm -hmm. And now they let school out, you know, for a day at a time, and all that parent teacher come. It was pretty taxing on the teacher, mm -hmm. but uh, you get it over with. Mm -hmm. And I know I called the superintendent and I said, we're going we're gonna to let school out at 2.30 this afternoon at parent-teacher conferences, okay. <laughs> it didn't bother him because another school wasn't doing mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. it didn't rattle another principal. That was another good thing mm -hmm. uh, with the principals that mm -hmm. were very understanding. I don't know what Roosevelt was doing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Simmering came into Roosevelt School the same time I came into Whittier. Well, Roosevelt was the largest school, and he was full-time principal, and I had mm -hmm. I was teaching. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and but uh, keep in mind that we're pushing for full-time art mm -hmm. and full-time phys ed at least three times a week, and mm -hmm. art two times a week, and mm -hmm. music, instrumental, mm -hmm. as well as vocal. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happened at that time at uh, Crawford, uh, between when I was at Crawford and Whittier, that we introduced uh, to the system counselors. Mm -hmm. And that was a very good uh, mm -hmm. progressive point, I thought. Mm -hmm. We've talked about some humorous things with children. Were there humorous things with your colleagues, your fellow teachers, or your fellow principals that happened? Oh yes, you, well, see, we had uh, we had an administrative meeting in the afternoon once a month with uh, Carl Brown and the superintendent, and uh, and that's when they would find out how we were doing that. And then, uh, to go back to another uh, aspect is that um, the individual schools, and they wondered, well, you know, why, and the board wondered, well, why am I, why are they doing it? We're hearing so much about this at this particular school, and we're hearing something different in another discipline at another school. Mm -hmm. And then as these children came into junior high, they were coming maybe from a different a little bit different levels, mm -hmm. um, and maybe some stronger in one, some areas than another. So the next, what they did, and I know we'll forget this, is that uh, we were having an administrative meeting one day, and uh, and Dr. Hetzel, after the meeting, said, and we were had curriculum meetings, and some administrator and uh, two or three teachers were going to be vertical curriculum chair mm -hmm. people. That's K-12 mm -hmm. in reading and science and math and social studies and other disciplines, which we all thought was a good thing. And mm -hmm. In other words, we could we could coordinate where we wanted to be, but mm -hmm. we didn't all have to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, Dr. Hessel called Floyd Sturdivant and me and said, uh, you two are going to coordinate the science and AIM schools, K-12. <laughs> and that was sort of the end of the meeting. He was handing out assignments. <laughs> and Floyd and I, he was a chemistry teacher at Ames High, said, Floyd, you better come down and talk. We better talk this over. So he, we met at Whittier School one night after our work was done. And, said, you know what superintendent told us? <laughs> we have the science program to coordinate K-12. And, uh, and they gave us some timelines on it. And he said, well, you know, I don't know too much about elementary. And I said, well, I remember from college science, college science and, and I said, well, yeah, we got, we got to get some communication going. That's mm -hmm. a big, mm -hmm. one of the big objectives, to get these teachers talking together to see where a fifth grade youngster might be going into junior high and mm -hmm. senior high. And it was, it was quite a challenge and fun. 
It was fun, and we had teachers taking on in certain grade levels in the system, and uh, mm -hmm. so our vertical curriculum uh, committees developed. Now, you ask about what are some of the colleagues? Uh, yeah, did they fun times with them? Uh, some of the fun times was, and, and of course, they looked at it at that time as, as kind of a playtime. It wasn't a playtime. <laughs> But it was to get out of town, mm -hmm. so we would. Uh, we had uh, sometimes a weekend, uh, a Friday night and a Saturday and a Saturday night uh, meetings, and so we just go to Clear Lake to get away from everything. Mm -hmm. And one weekend we went over to the 4-H camp. No one, our wives knew where we were, but that's where we were. Well, there was some talk about it. They're going over there or here and there. They don't. My golly. When you were with Mr. Hetzel or or Lou Kaiser or Dave Morey, I just had objectives to do. You had mm -hmm. meetings there, and had to come up with the answers and test them with the other administrators. Well, we went to 4-H camp, and you know, like sixth grade kids used to take field trips and overnight over at the 4-H camp, and uh, they had soil studies and. They had their academics there in math. Mm -hmm. They had identification of all kinds of things. And so some administrators questioned that. So what Dr. Hessel did said, we're going to have an administrative meeting there. So everybody will know what's going on. It just wasn't a couple of principals taking care of all the sixth grade kids <laughs> and teachers. Sixth grade and fifth grade teachers to his spouse and also the special teachers. So they were over there, and we were taking them the trail where these children and identifying things. And Everett Ritland was was on the lead because he used to have the 4-H, a lot of 4-H activities over there. Mm -hmm. So he knew the area like the palm of his hand. And Ritland, uh, you know, they they walked, and then they get a little tired. So they started they started up through the brush. That was a no-no. They didn't do what they were told to do, like a bunch of kids. So they got in the meeting that evening, and here they're all scratching, and they had been in poison ivy. So we had Mr. Hetzel recess the meeting, and these guys to take soap showers to get that poison ivy off of me. <laughs> and come back to me. Mr. H Mr. Hetzel didn't crack a smile. He, he said, <laughs> that was kind of interesting. And the other thing was that, you know, most of them have a gravel. What a gal, what he had was a rock. I mean, mm -hmm. On his trip, he'd found a rock about that big round. And that rock was the gavel for the meeting. And um, when he sounded that way, he was, he was very good. He knew what mm -hmm. he wanted to do. And he, he, he certainly entertained the ideas from all the administrators, and then, of course, knowing what the school board was wanting to do sometime, you know, he, he, he would uh, say, this is what we're going mm -hmm. to do. Now, if you find out that that isn't working, you want to change, let me know. You had mentioned that you were in the school system and you helped get counselors in the schools. Yes. And I wonder if you could tell me times when maybe they were useful. Uh, like maybe I'm thinking of the assassination of Kennedy or something like that. Is Did you find out that counselors were needed pretty quickly? Well, of course, there are always uh, those opportunities as a school uh, grows. There are also, sad cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, many of them, and you don't know, like those as part of life, I guess. And uh, then, then as your population grew, and as I said, these these children sometimes become detached. The school is really their main. Uh, emphasis during the week, and some of these children were uh, 
needed help, mm -hmm. either from the families or they had things crossways academically or mm -hmm. they needed someone else besides the teacher mm -hmm. because the teacher couldn't take all the time. She, she may, mm -hmm. she or he may realize it and work with them after school and but a counselor that working with a teacher can take that youngster mm -hmm. and talk with them and see what's mm -hmm. some more background of what's happening and then work with the teacher both. Mm -hmm. it, were, it worked out very well. I think they're extremely important now, mm -hmm. probably more so than ever. Mm -hmm. But yet there's a tendency to cut down on all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about how the physical classroom environment changed. When you started out in the 1950s, you probably had desks and a blackboard. And that was probably about it. Well, when I started out, in, uh, you had what they called standardized rural schools. And standardized rural schools had certain equipment in them. In other words, you had the maps, you had the encyclopedias, you had the uh, music instrument. The, mm -hmm. Mostly a piano or a mm -hmm. Victrola, a photograph that you wind up, um, and you had uh, the maps, and you were you were uh, uh, to spend a certain amount of time on academics mm -hmm. in a standardized school. Mm -hmm. And my first school was not a standardized school, mm -hmm. uh, but it had all the it had everything that you wanted, mm -hmm. but it just they just had not standardized it yet. Um, and they didn't standardize it because they knew the population was declining declining, mm -hmm. and there was no mm -hmm. use. But um, at, as I said, we used a lot of mail-in from the mm -hmm. corporations, mm -hmm. companies then, not mm -hmm. necessarily corporations, but companies mm -hmm. that were willing to send material for you to use. And mm -hmm. uh, aircraft uh, flying was emerging, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, agriculture was a agriculture was a part of the education program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't see that too much anymore. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, you know mm -hmm. so in the you said in the Whittier classroom they had two lights coming down, and the walls were white. That's mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a bell, <laughs> handbell. Mm -hmm. And you, and you had the map for that particular, what you were studying. You didn't mm -hmm. have a world map, or mm -hmm. if some youngster wanted to question on something else, you didn't have that map. Uh, but usually the stuff that we would get as teachers, and you go, and I have them, you pick them up, and there's the world map. You could show the, show the youngster. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we didn't have, uh, you had diddle. What they call hectographs. <laughs> you type up your math lesson, mm -hmm. or you have the problems here, and then you would go put it on a what they call a hectograph, mm -hmm. which is a jelly kind of a pad. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you would lift that off, and the imprint was on this jelly. Then you could get probably eight or ten copies off of that <laughs> before it faded. <laughs> and the, the old ones that I have now, of course, are nothing but a blank sheet of paper because it's all gone. <laughs> and uh, you did a lot of that type of thing. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, we didn't necessarily go for coloring books and mm -hmm. everybody, you know, that type of thing. It was more or less creative kind Tactic, of thing yeah. that we wanted to do. The building blocks kind of things. And, and we had, uh, but when you got in, it shifted all from that, like at Whittier then, mm -hmm. things really changed. We had brought in the motion picture, mm -hmm. the projector. Not one for the end. We had our own. Mm -hmm. The one going around, you never could rely on it. When a teacher wants something and a group of kids are ready for it, they're ready for it. That's what they want. They don't mm -hmm. want it next week. Mm -hmm. So one of the objectives in the M school was to get the materials that we wanted in each school, mm -hmm. and something live in the schools. The aquarium was better mm -hmm. than a sterile wall, mm -hmm. and uh, and to uh, the other thing that uh, was coming, uh, well, you had to 
motion picture projector versus the old slide projector at the, the, in the mm -hmm. rural schools. Uh, you had uh, electronic music all instruments, mm -hmm. uh, pictorials and the mm -hmm. photographs and that kind of thing, rather than to wind up and then spin, you know. <laughs> and uh, you had, uh, uh, oh, then we brought in maybe one microscope so that there at least be one microscope. In each building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole system was just emerged so that these mm -hmm. teachers to move the youngsters along like they should be needed material there. They don't need it tomorrow or the next day. They might need it in a unit, say mm -hmm. Thursday it could come in for the unit this week. But when it, you couldn't, they needed the microscope then. And that's mm -hmm. what we ended up with yeah. in our system. Well, I've... Um Really enjoyed talking with you, and I would like to know if there are any other stories you'd like to tell me about teaching in Ames or being your principal in Ames that maybe I haven't thought to ask you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with me this time around? I think I'll come back and talk to you again, but maybe can you think of any of this time? Well, you mentioned then that uh, Whittier and Crawford School, I was there at Crawford for five years. Then mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to... to um, Dr. Hetzel um, then put me at Bethesda and Whittier and the high school <laughs> when they had the elementary school at the high school. When was that? Well, that was in 1964-65. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So it would have been at the Old high school, which is now Central Junior High, or the high school on up north near Northcrest? They had part of the high school downtown. I thought they split. And they were adding. Yeah. And one of the interesting things, I was there eating my lunch at, at, the, at the high school, and I looked out, and there was a man, they were adding on to the high school, a person walking across the beam. Uh, so I recognized that fellow, and I dropped my quit eating and went out and talked to him. It was an eighth grader that I had in Dallas Center. Oh my goodness. Yeah, these are the kinds of things. That, uh -huh. uh, that makes teaching worthwhile. Right. Yeah. Uh, but then I went then from Bethesda in the high school and uh, Calvary Methodist Church. I had it quite a... Now why were classes in the churches? Because we didn't have the room in the schools. Schools mm -hmm. were not built. Mm -hmm. And this is this is one thing. Over a period of time, you have people asking, "Well, why didn't the schools do this? Why are you short now?" I read in the paper last week. Well, why why do you have a big gym and you don't have any storage? Or why do you have this? And why did you build here instead of over there? Um, that's all you could do at that time. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a tax base. Mm -hmm. And there are other pressures, other stakeholders in the community too, that uh, you get a school located and hold the dynamics of the community changed because uh, uh, NADL came in, was being. And you, I was also taking grad work at uh, the University of Colorado, and you should have heard, heard the play out there wanting the NADL <laughs> out at Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping it would get it in Ames. Well, just the idea of that coming into Ames just amplifies all kinds of ideas from stakeholders to uh, where do we build, how are we going to accommodate, how are we going to provide the mm -hmm. roads. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, they expanded to get uh, Sawyer School. Mm -hmm and Mitchell School, Northwood School, and Fellows was coming in. Mm -hmm. But Fellows then was really developed in about 1966 to 67. Mm -hmm. And then after all this conglomerate of other schools that I had had at Bethesda and at the high school and at Calvary and at, and at um, Whittier, then they asked, if, asked me if I would come to fellows. 
and basically some of the same children that were at some yes, of these other places yes. were coming yes. then to um, fellows. So, so that was that was a good feeling. <laughs> yeah, and also it's a good, tremendous feeling for the parents mm -hmm. to know that. Uh, that they've been scattered and been very patient, mm -hmm. and now we could get them all together in one unit, one unit. which was very good. Now they're separating them again. But I was so <laughs> pleased to hear the other day that the board said, look, we need community schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's... Um, were you a little bit sad when Whittier stopped being a school? Yes, I did. But it happened... Uh, it just, Whittier's in a good location, but it was developed at an earlier time around the DOT, mm -hmm. the universe close to the university. It was south of the railroad tracks mm -hmm. and Lincoln School mm -hmm. to the east. And it did, uh, it did accommodate people at that time. And, and by the way, since then, we've had uh, Whittier uh, get-togethers with former students and mm -hmm. parents. We've had two. And some of the former teachers then initiated one this past spring. Oh, this past summer, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. fall it was. It's this fall. Mm -hmm. And we had a number of students come back and staff people. Of course, the staff people were there. I bet they told some stories there. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. They, I never will forget, uh, at Whittier School, uh, and we had a real good, we brought science in and we had a good, good science program. And Jane Simon, she had a good science unit and the, the teachers had good science units there and, and, the, and uh, it was, and it snowed, it snowed that night on a Tuesday night and it was building up and building up and building up. They got about a foot to 15 inches of snow, and I had to go to Des Moines to get my wife after this thing. And they didn't, parents didn't care how deep that snow was. They stayed until 9.30 and uh, were visiting and uh, associating and looking at the science project that the children had. Mm -hmm. They were, they didn't care. And it's also the same time that John Glenn went around. <laughs> <laughs> so that was well. They probably weren't as worried because they were mostly neighborhood. They didn't have that far to go. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. probably it. Yeah. And you ask about uh, when President Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's about this time of year. Mm -hmm. It was. So, that's you know. exactly right. And I, of course, I didn't know about it. My Irene called me that mm -hmm. afternoon at uh, mm -hmm. Crawford, and she said, "You know, the President's been shot." And of course, I was a shock. And I, I, I really didn't know what I should do. But I, and one thing in the school, you have the children, and you, you got to, you got to. In other words, you, 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 you can't let things get in a disarray. Mm -hmm. And they need to have some security. So I did, I did tell the teachers. I went around and told the teachers that the president had been assassinated and that we're not letting school out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, the way that, that's the way that turned out. The other time, a little tragedy in the school, was the time that uh, the bombing of the city hall. 1969. And, uh, and that, is, uh, that was a time when rather it was sad and we didn't... Of course, uh, the chief told me, called me and told me about it, and we immediately, uh, I said, well, look, we've got people on the loose here. Are they my district or whose district or wherever they are? And uh, I was very happy to say that the chief told me, he said, look, we, and of course, we had children involved, so this, there was a lockdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the chief said that you're covered. Don't worry, we've, we've got you. Yes. So um, when you said a lockdown, you mean everybody stayed in the school? Everybody stayed. Mm -hmm. And the teachers then were monitoring and uh, who picked up the child. Ah, that okay. they had knowledge of that person or the okay. child stayed at school. Gotcha. 
So those kinds of things. The other time that was uh, kind of interesting, that was really scary, was when Prince Faisal uh, visited uh, Fellow School. And that was, uh, well, that's a whole story itself. I'll probably get into that another time, but... You tell me a little bit now. That'll be our last story for today. Yeah, that's... Uh, and, but there were, there are times, there was a time when we had a lockdown at Whittier. No one in or out of the building. And, uh, and then most people didn't realize it, but Whittier School was a really well-constructed building. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was concrete, period. And in the basement, we had emergency food in case of an atomic attack. I remember those days, yes. Remember those days? I remember uh, those days. So what was the lockdown at Whittier for? Well, it was some disgruntled people mm. at a particular time mm -hmm. that, uh, not with any of the teachers or anything like that. It was just that uh, uh, some of these elections get a little mm, carried see. away. Yeah. Well, Mr. Brendel, it's been a pleasure to talk with you today, and I hope I'll have a chance to talk with you again because there are lots of ideas that you've mentioned that I'd like to pursue. But for today, I want to wish you a pleasant day, and thank you for joining me. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>